Good morning. And those of you that don't know who I am, my name is Joel Grinder, and I'm sitting in for the pastor while he's out. And we're going to be, if you turn your Bibles or your apps on your phone, we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 7 through 12. Let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you. May our hearts be open to your word. May you enlighten our hearts. May you bless this time together, just taking in your word. And Lord, may you speak to each and every one of us what you have to say to us from your word. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 7 through 12. It's an important day today. It's Mother's Day. And if you have children and are a mother, then some of these statements on how you may have felt with your children may resonate. I'm just going to read a couple of them. Um, just a few, a few statements here. Silence is golden. Unless you have kids, the silence is suspicious. <laughs> the kid says to their mother... Mother, stop, you aren't funny. And mom said, I made you. <laughs> I love it when I find myself screaming, stop screaming at my kids. That's how I teach them irony. <laughs> mom, what's it like to have the greatest daughter in the world? I don't know, ask your grandma. <laughs> Being a mom to a teenager will make you understand why some animals eat their young. <laughs> Motherhood is a fairy tale in reverse. You start in a beautiful gown and end up cleaning everyone's messes. Nothing is lost until mom can't find it. And then the last one, a police recruit was asked during the exam, what would you do if you had to arrest your own mother? And he said, I'd call for backup. Even though these are a few slight jokes to tell and the humor's there, the role of a mother is crucial to the development of children within the family. There are qualities mothers display for us that we can see and that are also tangible because action is involved with each of these qualities. Some qualities just listed, unconditional love, patience, empathy, caring, Listening, consistency, trustworthiness, intuition, supportive, having a sense of humor, forgiving, affectionate, and so much more. And we don't have all the list. But these things show within that relationship of a mother and a child. Like this list of qualities, Paul in 1 Thessalonians tells the church in Thessalonica how he has cared for them, and he tells them in the most tender manner, because he cares for the church, that he also displays how he loves the church. So let me give you some background on 1 Thessalonians so we can understand where Paul is coming from. Some background. Paul, Silas, and Timothy are at the beginning of the letter. And they've worked diligently to bring the gospel to the church as directed by God. After being at the Jerusalem Council, if we go to Acts 16, Paul and Silas, they go through Derby and Lystra in the years between 50 to 52 AD. And Paul commissions Timothy to go with them on their journey headed toward Asia. Acts 16, 1 through 6 Paul, Silas, and Timothy, they start their journey to Asia. In Acts 16, 6 through 7, the Holy Spirit forbids the word to be spoken in Asia. So God stops that, stops them right there where they're at. Acts 16, 7 through 9, they went to Traos, and God gives Paul a vision of a man of Macedonia standing, urging him to come help them. 
And in Acts 16, 10 through 40, Paul, Silas, and Timothy immediately begin their journey toward Macedonia. They don't delay. They immediately go. Passing through Philippi, they were attacked, stripped of their clothes, beaten with rods, and thrown into prison. God delivers them from prison, and as a result, they continue to take the gospel into Philippi. The jailer during that time was saved through salvation and his family. And after Paul tells the magistrates about their humiliation being citizens of Rome, and they're asked to leave the city. So here's a synopsis before they're being prepared to be on their journey to Thessalonica. Thessalonica was a city back then of about 200,000 people in their days. They were caught up in pluralism of the pantheons of gods in Rome and the Greeks. And even the Jewish traditions is what they were caught up in from the Old Testament and the law, where Paul goes to reason with them. In Acts 17, we see Paul, as soon as he enters, he enters the synagogue and he reasons with them for three days with the Jewish people where people came to know Jesus Christ, but it doesn't mean that there wasn't adversity waiting. Paul is hindered by Satan, and there's a stirring up of wicked men that disagreed with the gospel message in Thessalonica, where they searched for Paul, saying he turned the world upside down, yet they could not find him. And in Acts 17, 10 through 15, some agitators find out he is in Berea, where he continues to lead others to salvation through Jesus Christ. Paul is hindered once again. Some agitators come there. They stir up the crowds. And we can see Satan behind the scene. Paul leaves Thessalonica. His brothers have him leave. And his brothers send him on, on towards Athens, and after being in Athens, he, he sends who was with him back to tell Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible. So Paul writes this letter to Thessalonians from Corinth, where he continues to encourage the church in their faith, showing them the example of Jesus, how to live for God continually, and the exciting, encouraging news of Jesus Christ's return in which we will all wait even for today for his return but we know he's coming. So the passage that we'll be looking at is the tender heart of Paul for the church and how he imitates Christ with the help of the Holy Spirit to lead the church. So in chapter 2, Paul begins by saying in verse 7, but we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you'd become very dear to us. It's interesting that he uses this analogy of a nursing mother. We look at that and we're like, why does Paul use the analogy of a nursing mother? Well, let's look at that a little closer. A tender heart. If we look at what a tender heart is, and mothers, you probably knows that, know this, right? A tender heart is a soft heart. Like a mother, his heart is prepared for the growth of his child, nurturing him, which would be the church. And if they make mistakes, he's there to help encourage and lift them up through Christ. He's available to them to continue to teach them and help them grow in Christ, giving them spiritual food from the gospel inspired by the Holy Spirit working inside of even Paul. So how he nurtures them is through the word of God. He's helping them grow. When a mother is nursing her baby, she's providing for her baby and giving herself to her child. The child's not mature enough in the beginning stages to do anything for themselves. Food is needed for growth, and the food for the church is given by Paul to 
hungry and thirsty believers in a dark place. If you don't know anything about Thessalonica, there was absolutely no believers in Thessalonica until Paul ventured there. It was dark in sin and idolatry, and then Paul comes along by the grace of God. A tender heart is a heart that is easily moved to love, pity, or even sorrow. A compassionate heart and a heart willing to listen to others, listening to their painful stories, and sharing in these moments of pain while returning a timely answer with the love of the gospel. So his heart is yearning to be with them again. As he says in in 8, he says, so being affectionately desirous for you, he wants to return back to them. He was, he was pushed out. They removed him. So why does Paul long for this? Why does he want to go back? He was pushed out. People were out to get him. They were agitating. Why would he go back to experience anything of suffering of any kind? I'll tell you a personal story. I've been in the military, I'm retired, and I was deployed in 2005 and 2007, and each time I went overseas to Iraq, which is a hostile place, it can be a dark place, especially when there's a war, right? My first deployment, my family longed for my return, and my first deployment, I wrote a letter to my oldest brother's wedding where I was supposed to be the best man, and I did the same for my second He was married on my second deployment. But on both those deployments, my parents tied a yellow ribbon around the porch of their house and hung one on the door until I returned home. So this is not a story to focus on my example, but what it's to give is the idea of a yearning and a longing for someone to come home or safely return in the fold of the family and not be turned away into the darkness and to the the situations out there that are dangerous, not turning back. So this church is growing in their faith, and he's not able to see what's happening. He doesn't get to hear about it quite yet. He doesn't get to hear about it till uh, chapter 3, when Silas and Timothy meet him at Corinth, and in Acts, that's chapter 18. But he longs, longs, to go and ensure the safety of their spiritual safety in the sense that he wants them to grow and be more like Christ. He also wants them to do well, but he does not know what they're experiencing in the moment, the afflictions that they have. So he has a concern about how the persecution may be affecting them and if they're going to turn back to their old sinful ways or they're going to stand firm. We've been studying with Pastor Adrian in Romans. And in Romans chapter 7, this is an, a good example here in Thessalonica where Paul, he, he has this concern of them turning back. So Paul knows what it is like in this, in this battle between flesh and spirit. And he explains it to the church in Rome. In Romans 7, 21 through 23, So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Paul here is seeing them come to Christ that they're no longer a slave to sin, but he's encouraging them to be alive in Christ. So Paul knows evil lies close at hand to the church because he experienced it by being hindered by Satan himself. So if Paul is getting hindered by Satan, then he's wondering what is happening to the church, and he's wanting word. While he is away at, in Athens and in Corinth, he, loves, he continues to show love for the church and concern and taking the message of God's word as he continues to wait for word from Silas and Timothy. Philippians 4.1 Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. As he does in Philippians, referring to the church as his crown, he does 
in 1 Thessalonians 2, 18 through 20. For what is our hope and joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. We look at our children, and they're our crown and glory, right? They've come from us. We're raising them. We have concern for them. Same thing with Paul and the church. In 1 Thessalonians 1-2, he says, We give thanks to God always for all of you constantly mentioning you in our prayers. So from a distance, even though he's not there in person, he's praying fervently for this church to continue to grow in love and grace and shine like a light in a dark area. His love is being shown where he is concerned about how they're doing spiritually. Physically, yes, there's persecution, but he's concerned about their spiritual state. So he's building them up in Christ from this distance. And how does he show this? 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7 Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoings, but rejoices in the truth. And love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. In 1 Peter 1.22, Having purified your souls by your obedience... To the truth, for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Paul here is loving this church from a pure heart. He's got these these concerns and he wants them to grow. He's showing that he's patient. He's showing all the aspects of love that he cares for this church. So the enemy is quick to try and drive a wedge between believers and he uses external interruptions for that. He tries really hard. These interruptions can tear at the church. And so Paul's heart is they be holy and obedient in Christ in their conduct and means by walking in the Spirit while loving each other and showing the love to all. We talked about that this morning, that it's not just the church that Paul encourages that they show the love and grace of God to, but it's everybody. In Romans 6.16, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves, slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? And we've talked about this too with Adrian's sermons that he's, he's preached about. We're a slave to either righteousness or a slave to sin. And obedience to God is towards righteousness. An example where Paul encourages Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 to preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Paul's, Paul's doing this from a distance. He's, he's ready at any moment, in season, out of season. He's ready to preach the word to their hearts, lifting them up and encouraging them in Christ. 1 Peter 3.15, But in your hearts, honor Christ, the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Paul is gentle in this letter, showing and setting the example to the church that he's, he's gentle and respectful to them. He's not tearing them down. He's an ambassador, showing the love of Jesus by serving others in love. Serving others. Mothers, you guys give yourselves to your families. You guys work And the guys do too, don't get me wrong. This is Mother's Day, all right? So it's Mother's Day. It's about Mother's Day. So they give themselves uh, to teaching children, the housework, working their jobs, and correcting any behaviors that need to be changed through discipline. They have resilience, and they set the example for your family, right? 1 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 10, For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We work night and day 
that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God, your witnesses, and God also. How holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct towards you. Paul's saying we labored. We didn't take anything from you. We weren't a burden to you. This is another way they're giving themselves to the church, not asking for money, even though they could, but they didn't. They were concerned about their spiritual well-being, and they were, they were taking care of them as a church. The Thessalonians needed to understand and see what humble, a humble servant looks like in Christ, and this picture shows how humble they were And it was not just to put on a show, but to draw others to Jesus. And when we talk about labor, Paul already mentions earlier, there's a labor of love. Loving somebody's not always easy, is it? Loving is something that we can't do on our own accord. And he's showing the reason for the Holy Spirit working in him that he loves this church. W.S. Reed says, Work, however, even though a man may be richly endowed with gifts, cannot be anything but ultimately empty unless man realizes that its true purpose is to glorify God. Apart from God, how is Paul able to love the church? Paul didn't abandon them. We see that here in this letter. In fact, the righteousness Paul that he shows from Christ is working in his life from the Holy Spirit. Philippians 3, 8 through 11. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his suffering, becoming like him in death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Christ is increasing in Paul, Silas, and Timothy in their messages to the church at Thessalonians and you can see it shining outward in his conduct. So he sets the example of humility. Philippians 2, 14 through 15, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. No grumbling or complaining. Now, if we do things on our own, sometimes I catch myself grumbling and complaining, right? But in Christ and looking to Christ, he's not complaining. He's encouraging them and lifting them up. So where does Paul get this? Paul can't do this on his own, so where does it come from? Well, Paul is imitating the grace of Jesus, Imitate. Paul uses the word imitate, and when we look at the word imitate, imitate means to follow or endeavor to follow as a model or example to resemble or have an appearance of. We talked in this morning that Paul, he is a man, and on his own, he's nothing apart from Christ because Christ is working in him. According to an article called Parenting Counts, children imitate their parents at a very young age. Children imitate their parents' behavior. Parents and caregivers' behavior presents powerful lessons to a child and leaves impressions on the developing mind. Children store in their minds both positive and negative images that may be imitated or tested later. And imitation provides children with the opportunity to practice and master new skills. So what is Paul showing the church? He's imitating Christ. He's showing them the discipline of being in Christ, being in the word, and taking the message to others. 1 Thessalonians 2, 11 through 12, For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom of glory. Like a father... 
encouraging them, walking with them, walking in a manner that's worthy of God. As parents and mothers, right? Parents, though, are we walking with our children in the message of God? Are we raising them up with the new skills they need to be in the world? The world's a dark place. It's sin, right? Sin is in the world. But there's that light, a light that can be seen, and it's through us and in us, those who believe. Paul reminds they're imitating Paul, Silas, and Timothy while also imitating the churches, but ultimately they're imitating Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 1.6, he says, And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Thessalonians 2.14, For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea, for you suffered the same thing from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews. He explains how a father, and he refers to an earthly father, he encouraged them, and not just encouraged, but strongly urges the church to walk in a manner that is worthy of God. He's not saying worthy of Paul. He's saying worthy of God. So their first step as a church, faith. And Paul makes it clear in Thessalonians in chapter 1, faith is always first. You start with faith, believing in Christ that he is the Savior. First coming to salvation and then being immersed in the gospel as well as being involved with a community of believers with a Christ-focused leader of the church. And Paul is leading this church even from a distance, but he also has help where there's Timothy and Silas and they lead as well because they come back and they give a report later to Paul on how it's going. In Acts 26, we see the story that Paul tells before King Agrippa. And it's a beautiful story where he tells the king who he was before Christ and who he is after Christ being in him. And he says, Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly visions, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the regions of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. The writer of the Hebrews gives us some more to look at with this, where he says, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you, and the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. So Paul is being this example of a mother and a father nurturing and caring for him, but also exhorting him, encouraging him. And we also know that the Bible talks about, we use the Bible for correcting and rebuking others as well. Galatians 5.25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Today you've seen grace highlighted in red on the slides throughout as they go, go about. And this is the grace of Jesus Christ for you and for me. He shed his blood and he saved us only by grace on the cross. Paul is giving himself in this loving manner, setting the example and showing the grace of God in him as well giving himself to the church. Romans 3, 23 through 25 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. We need a Savior. Paul is an example, yes, but Christ is the ultimate example of love and grace. And that's where Paul is getting this. And we've talked about in the last sermons that have been 
put before us with Adrian, the Holy Spirit working in us to show the love of Christ towards others and to raise those who are new in Christ and less mature to mature in Christ and get more food of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15.10 But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain, and his grace toward me was, was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. He's showing the church at Thessalonica, it's not me, it is Christ. I am who I am, it's Christ in me that's making this difference. So are we bringing others alongside us who are new in Christ and are we teaching the gospel? Are we speaking to others in the world and even in the church with a tender heart? Are we serving others where ourselves decrease and Jesus increases? And last, are we imitating Jesus, imitating him, not just mimicking him, not just a mimic of what it looks like on the outside, but inside is the Holy Spirit in us that we are imitating him and shining and radiating out for the whole world to see. Some stuff to ponder there, right? I'm going to let the worship team come forward. Um, Really quick, would you just pray with me while they come forward? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together to be able to look at your word. Lord, help us imitate you and the love and grace of Jesus Christ. And Lord, if there's people here that don't know who you are, Lord, May you just work on their hearts. May you help them to come forward and be able to share any concerns. And Lord, you've come for all, not just select, but all. And all are welcome to come to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.